Uh, my name is Ken. I work at AI Singapore. Uh, today I'll show you a tool which I, I kind of like developed on my own after I left DBS. I was in DBS uh, technology team writing a lot of test cases for test automation. I was there for a year. Then I left the team, uh, you know, just packed my bags, uh, went to Eastern Europe with my wife, stayed for a year. And during that time I developed this tool. Uh, you can use it for test automation, you can use it for RPA, robotic process automation and so on. So I just jump right into the demo. Uh, okay, I think I need uh, internet access, so let me tether. Okay, so I'll just focus the time on just doing demos, then later on you can ask me questions. Okay, um, let's say this example, okay, let me connect it. Oh, I cannot see my Wi-Fi. Why? Mm. Okay, here. Yeah. I, ho I hope the connectivity is okay. Yeah, so you can kind of use it to automate um, web interactions, uh, desktop application, and so on. So in this example, I'll just use it to uh, automate extracting information from M1 website. So the use case for this is my wife want to get a new handphone number from M1. So I, after I develop the tool, I simply uh, write a script to do the automation, like selecting her very parameters, and then kind of like script the content of the website, something like that. So what this tool does is it convert a human language-like type of syntax into JavaScript code. So for one line of interaction, let's say click here, enter here, type this. So that one line becomes maybe 10 lines of JavaScript code that does the automation in the back end. So the foundation layer will be Casper.js, Phantom.js, and I write the integration layer directly to talk to Chrome. Um, you can run it headless Chrome, visible Chrome, and so on, that's fine. And uh, besides grabbing data from website, you can interact with your desktop application as well. So after downloading this, actually the actual run, I, I did it for let's say 30 over pages. For this case, I just do one page as a demo. So what you see now, the typing on the screen to auto uh, application is done using visual recognition. So I, I supply, yeah, this is actually the, it's not pre-recorded, it's actually uh, actual automation running. Yeah, and then selecting images and so on. So by mapping this type of processes that people do in their, you know, their work, you can kind of automate all these processes. Um, the code for this example is a bit low, but let me try this. Okay, for example, the one to do the outlook email sending, that's all the code you need to, that's the actual code already, yeah, the script, to do the email sending. For the grabbing the details from M1, it's a bit more complicated because uh, we are trying to do something more than just getting the front end stuff. For example, we want to get information like the price. You notice on the website just now, you don't have price, so you've got to write a normal JavaScript code to get the price. So this is a script for getting the, the M1 numbers. Okay. Okay, I'll go ahead and do some other demos. Okay, let me close this. Um, maybe, okay, let's say letter automation. This is a use case from NUS. Um, they, they get a donation letters and so on. They scan it as a PDF. They want to extract the information, um, who's the donor, the address, and then automatically uh, print it as letter to mail a thank you letter. Yeah, so, so what you're seeing now is, you know, uh, I'll skip the donation receipt part because sensitive info. I'll just assume we have the info and then populate it in this letter and, and try to print it, yeah. So things like this, you can, um, if you have a data table, you have a spreadsheet, you can do it at scale, this type of stuff. And they'll automate printing, oh, 100 letters. And then after that, of course, you've got to manually you know, put in a letter and so on. Yeah, so all this you can do. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So let me go to the other, let me just stop it. I think it's trying to quit and don't save. Okay. Um, okay, so for, for this too, for those of you guys who are in test automation, let's say you're a developer, um, you would like to do things like um, having CI and uh, CD integration. So that, that this tool does it as well. Let's say I want to do a test of, um, Something like this. 
you know, this is how a normal script looks like. There's a lot of uh, commands, but in general, you have one step for each uh, UI interaction step that you want to do. And each line converts into JavaScript code that actually runs the automation. So this example, it goes to uh, Yahoo Finance web page, do a search, and then you know, show the results. Yeah, let me try to run it in um, the test automation mode so that you will have a XML file at the end, which you can use for your Jenkins, Circus CI, and other things. You know, so all these things like read search button to search tag actually becomes 10 lines of JavaScript code that does the back-end automation. So this is slightly different from Cucumber and Gherkins where for each English language line, you've got to write a matching code in the back-end. Okay, uh, yeah, so let me run, show you in the foreground. So I intentionally add a negative test case. So I search for Microsoft, but I look for the word Apple, right? So intentionally to test this part. then. After you run it, at the end, you have an XML file, which you can pipe it to your Jenkins integration. Um, yeah, it's a bit messy here. So let me do it from here. Okay. To the website. Um, samples. Oh, yeah. Um, then another thing for this is it has Python integration and R integration. So. Uh, where's number seven? Seven. Uh, I think I okay, somewhere there. Yeah, but never mind. Let's skip in the interest of time. So it has Python and R integration. By this, I mean uh, within a normal script for this tool, you can actually write Python code and runs with your machine learning framework and do inferencing. So let, let me do an example here. Um, something like that. So this is a normal script. Let's say you go to a website, do something, you know, you can pipe all this information to Python and get the data back. All right. Uh, just run it. Yeah. Same for R. R is a language used by data scientists for statistical analysis. Right. Things like that. Okay. Um, I'll do using a real use case. Maybe this one, download profile photos. So uh, as Singapore, we want to grab the so-called database of uh, researchers in Singapore doing AI, and we want their profile photos, right? But if you go to a website, all the images to a computer, it doesn't know what are profile photos, right? You can grab all the images, yes, but uh, you can't really detect out of the 10 images, which ones are the profile photos. Some may be um, university logo, maybe A-star logos, and so on. So in order to solve that, you know, we can use this tool because it integrates with Python. So let me, and then uh, use uh, any free open source Python library for face recognition. I use the one that's very popular called face recognition. And what it does is, for example, this uh, professor, right? There's a few images on the website, this one, this one, and all these are images. So after getting all these images, you know, I pipe it to the Python uh, integration and then do a face recognition using the pre-built deep learning model and get the results back. Uh, so out of all this, for these four photos detected, um, the script will be able to detect, oh, actually this is the face for that from my website. So things like this you can do. Yeah, so let me try to queue it. Yeah, so um, if you are interested to find out more, just search tech UI. Uh, then the first result you see will be the, that project. Yeah. And on the website, you can um, have things like um, the tutorial, which is show you step-by-step -step how to do some of those things, uh, sample workflows, a short slide deck, and a video uh, of my presentation at FOSS Asia three months ago. Yeah, then these are the other stuff. Let me see. There's also a Chrome extension for you to, to record your automation. Let's say you do a particular workflow, you can record what you do, and you spit out the corresponding script, which you can run directly already and make adjustments. Uh, yeah, it can also understand 20 over uh, human languages. Let's say I do a, a oh.
Okay, let's say I want to run automation that's written in Chinese. That's fine too. Um, most of the languages I actually use Google Translate to self-build because after I create a tool, I just write a script. It goes to Google Translate, get all the definition of 20 other languages and create the dictionary. Yeah. Uh, so this one, okay, let's say Chinese. All right. C H I. All right, so this file is written in Chinese. So this is how a automation script looks like. Uh, maybe I just run in Chinese. Right. I just need to change the flag to Chinese. Okay, and then I can run it. Um, yeah, in a visible browser. So this uh, example, oh, I, I got disconnected, is it? Yeah, somehow I lost connectivity. Oh, I see the data, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> usually I set 200. <laughs> so let me see whether I can, yeah, I can connect now. Yeah, let me try. Yeah, so, yeah, things like this, running in Chinese, you can do as well. Yeah, I think it, it somehow got confused. Let me try to run it again. So you can write a script in Chinese, English, um, uh, Hindi, uh, Japanese, Korean, that, that's fine, yeah. You know, in this uh, English, human language looking like syntax, which converts into code and runs. Let's say you have a script written in Chinese, but um, for some reason, your users are based in, let's say, uh, Indonesia, right? So you, you may be able to do something like that. I think it's Indonesian yeah, for the language. Okay, then, yeah, you can run the same thing, uh, except this time the output will be in Indonesian. Right. Yeah, so stuff like that you can do. Yeah, so uh, yeah, that's all. Any questions? Otherwise, yeah, just ask any questions. Otherwise, when you Google Tech UI, you go to this page with all the documentation and info. It's free, it's open source, it's full featured. Yeah, so just go ahead and use it if it's relevant to what you're doing. Yeah. yeah so, any questions? Yeah. Hi, uh, really cool project. Oh, um, thank you. You have like a, sort of a ton of stars on this project called. Mm. And I was wondering how did you get it so successful? Um, okay. It's really awesome in itself, but like, did you do anything to promote? Or yeah, yeah, of course. Open source is really cutthroat these days. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, yeah, it's, it's very hard to do open source. It's like kind of being consumed by the business world. And if your open source project becomes successful, you have a problem because you have so many users that you can't support at, uh, as a part-time job. Yeah. So I, I guess open source today, in my own view, is kind of like dead because the only people doing open source and hot projects are the big organizations. The small person, it's very hard to do a project and sometimes you're mixed what if it's successful, what I'm going to do next, right? So at the time, um, when I make the initial release, I think somebody shared on uh, this hacker news, uh, and, and this, uh, it just got trending, yeah, to 100,000, uh, 1,000 over stars. Then after that, I got to do the usual marketing stuff, which I look at uh, popular open source projects on GitHub. Then I use a tool to scrape the users. <laughs> I use a tool to spam them, uh, email them. I, I won't say spam, but because those people that start those projects are actually looking for tools that are similar to this. So in a sense, yeah, I, you know, it's kind of like a line. So um, before I email a large batch, I'll email a small batch to test out, right, 50. Then if those 50, the responses, like there are more people that call me, that encourage me, right, I'll just stop emailing to that, that the particular GitHub project. And I do this for a few GitHub projects. And, you know, over the course of one year, become 2,000 over stars and more and more users. Yeah. yeah. So, yes, you got to do marketing as well. It's crazy, but to give free stuff, you got to promote it as well. It's just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Did UI interaction, does mm. it work for Windows or Linux? Uh, yes, uh, that's a good question. It works for Windows, Mac, and uh, Linux, all the three OSs, yes. I, uh, yeah, open source should support three OSs, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Have you had a demo where you capturing the images of people in Singapore? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, where did you get the names from? Was that also automatically extracted? Oh, the names people have to provide. Yes, the list of the researchers. Um, yeah, that part you still have to do manually. The URLs, the homepage, or the names, you, we have to curate from a list. Then from the list, we crawl the info. Uh, I forgot to mention, you can do OCR as well. Yeah, you, you have a PDF or text document. You can do OCR to convert it to text directly within the tool. Yeah, and accounting firm in Singapore is using this to automate some of their IRAS process. Log into IRAS, see what IRAS, uh, let the let PDF IRAS send to them, uh, to their clients, and see what is the cost of action for those clients, and then automate uh, that part of the process. Yeah, it can just OCR as well. Yeah. How was your motivation for I think doing test automation on staging system is too boring. <laughs> yeah, for 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 then. So after a year, I got really bored. Like, uh, I want to touch production system, but in DBS tech team, I can't. It's a test automation, right? You only have staging environment to play with. So um, then I left to see whether I can find a job in uh, Europe. But uh, then we stayed there for a year. But it turns out there's a lot of terrorist stuff, so I came back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, even Manchester is not spare, right? The second and third tier city are not spare. So I realized uh, Singapore is safer, so I came back. <laughs> yeah. And then the other motivation would be um, I, I was never a developer for my 10-year-plus uh, career. So I thought it's a good time to, to try to learn some coding. Yeah. So you know this thing is written in JavaScript, mm, PHP, Shell Batch, Python, and R. Yeah. These things are all those languages I learned along the way. Yeah. So it's more of a both self-learning and both a uh, uh, curiosity. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm. I'll go ahead. So uh, like, you know, for the human readable part, yep. the team, human voice, is it, are those keywords? Mm. Or? Yes, that's, that's correct. Uh, if you see on the cheat sheet, you see all the list of the keywords. It's the usual UI steps like click, tap, hover, you know, select, read, and so on. Yeah. Then there's also the advanced steps like um, integrating with your Python, your, your visual recognition, your R and JavaScript stuff. You have that as well. Yeah. Uh, people using your tool, what's mm. the most interesting, mm. surprising thing you've seen people use it for? Um, uh, not surprising, but the people tend to scrape competitor website <laughs> for information. <laughs> <laughs> and they usually don't want to share that they're doing it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I know some users can write very a amazing scripts that, yeah, I think the users use this better than me. Yeah, I generally think so. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm good at just creating it, but I think the users do a lot of interesting stuff. Yeah, and some may use it to play games, like you have a game that you've got to keep kicking to get <laughs> increase the score. You can write a script to automate that and look for the certain outcomes on the screen to pop up. Then you do the next thing to click. Yeah, yeah you can do things like that. Yeah. Can this be misused by, for example, spammers? Yeah, of course. Things? Yeah, this like a, a boss on matchstick, right? You can use it for good and evil. Yeah, I don't decide for you how you want to use it. <laughs> <laughs> I used to put a disclaimer: please don't use it for evil. But I think people won't listen anyway. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. Does it work on pages with captcha? Ah, uh, yeah. That's a good question. So the professional way to do it is to engage to capture solving services. You send an API call to them. They'll either solve it manually, uh, automatically for you, or if their algorithm fail, they'll have a, a team of uh, human uh, workers to do that for you. Yeah, you pay per, per click. Yeah, pay per use. You can do that. Yeah, but you got to pay la. Yeah, yeah. He has an API call. Uh, just use the API uh, step. Um, then. You know, you can do a usual API call with header, put, uh, whatever, and the type of get, push, put request, and whatever. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, mm. they use your tool to scrape data, right? Mm. So uh, how about the concurrency part? Concurrency as in? Do they need to handle it themselves or your tool have already? Uh, concurrency means uh, waiting for something to appear? Yeah, like mm. they want to. For example, they want to scrape a website, mm. a whole bunch of websites mm. at the same time. Mm. And oh. How do you improve the performance? Oh, okay. Uh, usually, I recommend people to break up into batches. It supports data table. So you have a, let's say, CSV file of 1,000 records, right? You can actually just run it, or you can split it to half, or, or maybe three. So, let's say you have 3,000 records. You split it into three files and run it on three PC. In practice, uh, in theory, you can run on the same PC, but I realize Chrome takes up a lot of memory. So for my computer, I run four sessions. It usually will start to slow down. 
yeah, that uh, the part is handled by user manually. I don't want to make it too easy to do parallel run because uh, you get me into trouble eventually. <laughs> yeah. hey, the use case for doing bad things in parallel run is usually more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, yeah. Can you roughly speak about the building blocks of this project? Oh sure. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Um, so under here, how it works. Uh, Chrome Devs 2 protocol, I open WebSocket direction to talk to Chrome directly using its native language because I don't want to depend on the Chrome remote's uh, uh, interface project. Yeah, because if you use uh, other projects for open source project, right, when you have a bug upstream, right, you cannot point a gun to that guy to fix it, right, and he becomes a bottleneck to your project. So as best as I can, I use everything like in build, lah, yeah, build myself. But there are things which I use directly off the shelf, like Schooly for the visual recognition part, Casper JS, Phantom JS, and Slimer JS is for the Firefox part. Yeah, this so these are the underlying tools. But uh, yeah, one thing I forgot to mention: uh, this thing is so easy to run. You can just stick it on any laptop and computer, unzip and run. You can put it in a thumb drive to run as well. You don't need to install a developer Node.js environment or Python environment. You just uh, you can just unzip and run. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do I go to any other meetups? Yeah. I usually, yeah, just code. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, so I don't go out here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was telling my friends, I, I kind of like got no life, so I got spent a lot of time on this kind of stuff. Yeah. Feel free to come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks,